I think it started very early. Um, first, I wanted to be a DJ in a very strange way. To be honest, I don't really understand why still because when I started, there was no such thing as a famous DJ. So there was no fame, there was no money. There was really, you know, it was really not the best job in the world, but um, I was not coming from a musical family. So uh, I guess, you know, if you're not classically trained and you love music that much, that's a good approach. Um, so I started with uh, uh, DJing, um, but when I started, a lot of DJs, they were more like, almost like radio DJs, they would talk between records. Yes. I'm talking about the 80s now. Uh, and um, and me, it was all about like, you know, the technical aspect of the job. Uh, I was into like, you know, mixing and remixing, making special edits of records. Um, and then later, adding drums on the top of records that uh, were already existing. Uh, then, you know, later I was starting to make remixes and uh, so mostly drums and bass line um, and only later I started to uh, create music including chords and melodies. When do you think you, you first started, you know, incorporating your own chord structures and things into music? I'm sorry. When do, when do you think you started kind of, um, you know, making my, my own uh, compositions, you mean? Yeah, your tunes. Sorry, I'm going to turn off. Uh, well, it's, it's kind of switching from, from that. Um, well, it, it's, it's really crazy because um, it all happened by accident, to be honest. Um, and I think. You know, and there's always, uh, you know, a lot of about the talent, a lot about work, but you also need a little bit of luck. And um, I started again to make music in 2001 because I stopped for a moment. Um, and uh, how long did you stop for? <clears throat> well, I started as a DJ. But at that time, you have to understand there was no such, you, there, there was no famous DJ when I started. So, you know, it was, it was really hard. And people would not let me play the music I wanted, the owners of the club. It's going to sound really crazy, but when I was a DJ, you would have to play the records of the club. Um, and uh, I wanted to play house music. And I'm talking now in 88. And uh, no club owners would let me play this music. So I was working in a club and I told them, look, uh, Monday night is empty. Just give me the Monday night. I'll promote the night. I'll make the flyers. I'll, I'll do everything. Just pay me a regular DJ fee, which was at the time uh, uh, 400 francs, which is uh, probably 70 60 pounds, something like this. Um, so, you know, I was, I was doing this, and this is how I started to be a promoter. Because the only way for me to be able to play the music I wanted to play was to promote my own night. Because if I was working for a, a club owner, he would tell me, no, you need to play this and this and this, and music I didn't like. I took a sample of a record I, I, I used to, to love, El Nafish, that I used to do scratched demos when I was a, a kid. And I took this sample and I couldn't play chords, so I just played with two fingers uh, the fundamental of the chord, which is, you know, the bass, basically. So you don't really need to be, uh, you know, uh, uh, classically trained to play four notes, you know? Yeah. Uh, uh, but at the same time, it does give you the four chords. And uh, the day after, I'm going to the restaurant and I'm meeting Chris Willis uh, and, and just like that, you know, vibing with a person that was nice, uh, what, what 
do you do in life? You know, and he's like, well, I'm a, I'm a gospel singer. And I said, oh, wow, really? That's crazy. I just made a beat. You want to come to the studio to listen to it? And <laughs> the guy came, and uh, I had this, old, this whole vision of a song, and I told him what to do. And he did, and it was OK. And then he, he made what we call an ad lib, which is like an impro, you know. And the ad lib was 10 times better than uh, what I did. <laughs> And um, I was like, oh my God, this is insane. And it was my first record, Just a Little More Love. And that part, I only took that little part and made it the whole record. And, and because it was coming from church, he knew everything about, uh, you know, uh, um, how do you call it? In, uh, I'm sorry. So because he was coming from church, he knew everything about harmony. And that little sample that I took, he harmonized it. And from him, I started to understand the concept of chords. Um, and then, you know, chords are the foundation of everything in music. But when you come from a DJ point of view, usually you don't look at it this way. No. And what's interesting in dance music is that there's almost an internal conflict. So. The, the foundation of uh, efficient dance music is to be hypnotic and repetitive. And uh, it's based on drums and bass line. That's what works in the club. And then what makes you emotional is chord progressions. And that's what works on the radio. So there was always a sort of conflict between dance music that was, you know, based on rhythm and radio music that was based on more harmonic, melodic kind of music. And um, that's how I started, being more the normal DJ, you know. And then by working with, with Chris, that was a really important part of my life, you know, I, I understood concept of harmonies and, and chords and, and melodies and I got kind of hypnotized by him you know and, and then I was like okay you know what what I'm gonna do is do the verse the equivalent of a verse uh, what we call to the a drop that would be the musical part that is gonna be straight and hypnotic but at some point, I'm going to break it down and do a full chorus with chord changes. And that was completely new. I mean, today, of course, uh, every dance music works like this. But at that time, it was really the different. The beginning of that. Yeah. And also, I was like, OK, when I DJ, I like to, you know, with the EQ, take out the beat when it's singing. And I'm like, I'm going to do this in the studio. What I'm doing in the club you know, using filters and EQs, I'm going to do it in the studio. And I'm, I'm not going to leave the drums when it's the chorus. When normally, at that time, you would think you have more drums on the chorus because you want more energy. And, and again, that was like a new type of arrangement. Um, and this is when I did uh, uh, Love Don't Let Me Go and Love Is Gone. And that for the first time, with Chris I singing. Yeah, both yeah. Because really, I was making all my records with him. I mean, they were fantastic records. They were, and and do you did you think at that time, you know, we're on to you know, we're going to revolutionise pop music? Oh no, not at all. Did you just think? Not at all. Because I mean, it just sounds like you you were having fun. Yeah, I was just having fun. But really, it's it's really crazy because at this time, I didn't have any intention of being pop. So basically, I was making the dance music I wanted to play as a DJ. So you know, it was like I was really into Electro House. There was this whole movement from Germany. And I, I, I felt like it was really cool, but you know, it was missing melody. Yeah. So when I was DJing, what I would do is that I would play those underground beats 
and I would add a cappellas. And I would filter the music and to play the a cappella, then I would use effects to create what we call today a build-up. And then I would open everything and and you know and go into an instrumental part. So basically I just applied what I was doing as a DJ live to the studio. And instead of using an a cappella that was a sample or something that was already existing, we created some new songs with Chris. And this is this is how it started. But I never thought they would play it on the radio. That was not my goal at all, you know? And how, how did you feel when they did? It was amazing, of course, you and know? Did, did, it, did it kind of motivate you from there? Because it oh, seems... Oh, but then it became an obsession. Yeah. <laughs> because, you know, um, I really felt like some, something that was going to be part of history was happening. And, you know, it, 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 was, it was crazy for me, like, just the fact that a little French guy, you know, would have, you know, his music played in the US and in the UK when, you know, all my heroes were from there. And, you know, for me, it was just insane that, you know, I could play in London. When I discovered house music in a club called Shum in London, you know, I discovered even the concept of a DJ being on stage. This didn't exist in France, you know? So, like, the first time they let me play in the UK, to me, it was insane. The first time, you know, I had a UK number one, even more, and, and not to mention America later, you know? So, yeah, that, it, it kind of happened by accident, but, it, but really, I, I was so dedicated, you know, and I was so obsessed with music, and I was also, like, really experimenting, you know? I remember... Uh, making records that I would really try the craziest stuff, you know, like uh, I heard a record from the Beatles that they were, you know, using stereo to separate the drums and, and, and the vocals. And I was like, oh, this is cool. I'm going to do it. You know, like no rule because I didn't know anything about music, really. I was just trying stuff, you know, and, and there was this record that is called Distortion and, uh, and, you know, it was just Chris telling me in the mic, Oh, there's a there's distortion in my left hair, and you know, because we didn't have at the time there was no money, we didn't have like a sound engineer to cut the records. We'd do it ourselves, you know. So, you know, I used that and made a record out of it. You know, like stuff like this. It was, it was just experimentation, you know. You know, or I have memories really like um, there was this record that I just realized that if I play only black notes. It could not go wrong because I didn't know scales at that time. <laughs> so I was just I just made a whole record playing the black notes. I was like, ah, this is magic. Everything sounds good. You know, and made a whole song. But really, like I had no idea what I was doing. But it was kind of cool and it was fresh because of course compared to people that were making pop music that were doing, you know, like like some some really always the same four chords that you hear in pop music. Of course, yeah. my stuff was a little bit weird because I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't go to school to learn that, you know, if you play, uh, you know, I don't know, uh, like a, a traditional... A uh, traditional uh, progression that it... Progression, you know... Uh, I mean, that's probably you know, what made it sound so fresh. Exactly. But it was kind of an accident. And then later, because um, at that time I was like, I wanted to be super cool and, you know, I was very judgmental on pop music and, you know, and, but then... So you wanted to be kind of more like, you know, cutting edge. And yeah, like, because this and is, this was my world. To be honest, music. I never wanted to be underground. I was just underground because my scene was underground. Yeah. You know, it's not like, for me, I, I was never, I wanted to share my passion with everyone. I wanted to, you know... If I love this type of music, I don't want to keep it only for my basement and my 10 friends. Well, I mean, that's, that's very clear, though, because right from the early days, you agreed to promote a whole night just so that you could play your music to other exactly. people. Exactly. So, so you've always so, wanted to spread the So word. my approach, even though I was playing underground nights, was never, no, I don't want to share. I want to keep, uh, 
for a, a, a lead. Or I, I never had this approach. You know, I I was just when I started considered underground or cool or whatever, uh, just because no one knew this type of music and it was it was new, so it was the underground scene that was into it. But it's not because I wanted to be underground. And actually, the minute I could share with more people, I did, you know. And what was interesting is that I, um, even though I had this little bit of an attitude when I was young, you know, I started to try to understand how people write songs because, of course, I was, I had success. So I was like, you know, when, it, you, know, when you touch radio success, whatever anyone is going to say, you want more. Yeah. You know, because it's so rewarding, you know, when you, when you see, like, uh, you know, thousands of people singing your songs everywhere in the world. Uh, it's, Must be amazing. it's extremely re rewarding, you know. And, and, and from that time, I started to study songs, you know, start to, you know, copy chords from others, from old music, for example, you know, and, and instead of sampling or, you know, uh, making more like repetitive music. And, and, and then I started to realize that it was not so easy. <laughs> I started to realize that pop music is actually probably the hardest music to create. And, uh, but I never, you know, for me, when I was a kid, I was like, this music is, is for stupid people. You know, this is a uh, completely, uh, this commercial music is, is you know, is uh, so formulated, but the reality is that it's, it's extremely hard to make, you know? So basically- And to connect with people as it changes. Exactly, exactly. And, and also because you see that every record that is really, really successful is usually an original approach of pop music. And, and finding a new formula is so hard, you know? So like I said, you know, it happened to me a little bit by accident. And then I saw, let's say, an opportunity to share my passion with more people. And I, I worked really hard to try to you understand, it. you know. Uh, and I wasn't classically trained, but I always had a certain understanding and a certain ear and a certain vision for music. And um, But basically, I would always, you know, um, I would always be influenced by, by my job as a DJ. So basically, I would play in underground parties. I was like, oh, wow, this new sound is reacting really well. But because uh, usually the, the kids that are making those, those beats, they don't know music the same way that I didn't know music, but they have like something cool, you know, in the way they produce. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to use that and but just make it more musical so that there's a real hook that people remember and basically that's what i've done my entire life you know whether it's as a dj when i was playing a cappellas on top of house music records uh, or, or acid records that that were so weird and underground but i would break it down and have a hook that everybody would know and then later that's that's what I've done in your my own production. Records. And when so when things started to get, you know, really really huge, like globally for you, and you're you know you're suddenly not only an original artist in your in your own right, one of the biggest in the world, and then but you're also highly sought after as a producer. You know, how did that feel having? Because by all accounts, you were doing it for fun. And, uh, you know, yeah. you, you still have the joy, you know, like you've had like so many years <laughs> of success, like out of all the people we've interviewed, you know, you've really uh, got a very like contagious, you know, you. kind of joy for what you do. So because it's a miracle. <laughs> I told you I was playing like this. How did I get there? It's like, you know, so how did and you I'm transition? Not, I'm not hiding it. I'm not pretending to be, you know, like I work with the most amazing musicians, you know, and and, and sometimes I'm ashamed. Because I'm like, how did I get with those people, you know? But usually, like, I have, you know, I have, like, ideas that are a little bit out of the box. And finally, you know, 
this is what makes a hit. When you know you approach um, music with a different vision. So this is how I got more comfortable with myself, even though you know I felt like limited. So of course I've learned, but you know this. Like when you don't start when you're five years old, you can never get to a level where you know someone that is classically trained can get. But um, but I've learned how to live with myself and my way to work, and uh, and also to to surround myself with musicians that are that are great, and that when I hit a wall, uh, that is. Uh, you because of my lack of theory, then I can ask someone that does it better than me, but I know where I want to go. I know what I want to hear, you know? Um, and you've got, you know, you've got the ear, I guess, from being yeah, so obsessed exactly. about music. Because, you it's know, more important. I've been playing music since I was 12, and I'm 52. <laughs> so, you know, this is uh, um, in the same way that uh, you know, what I realized, because I had kind of a complex when I started, you know, um, people that are composing, you know, that are amazing composer, they also take it from somewhere. It doesn't come out of nothing. They've been trained to know that this chord works good after this chord. Oh, They've been tra trained to know that, you know, if you put a chord number five at the end of the uh, of the of the sequence of chords, it's gonna feel really good when it comes back to one because you learn this, you know. In the same way, I have accumulated a, 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 like a huge database of records of music that I've played my entire life. So, very often the way I think of music is by association, and you know, like I hear a melody. It's funny because I did this yesterday <laughs> in my bedroom. You know, someone sent me a demo and the song was amazing, but I didn't like the chords. And I, I hear it and I hear, wow, this reminds me of this record. And, you know, it happened that, of course, because I have a certain ear, the record that I'm thinking of is in the same key. And then I play the chords of the record that I'm thinking from the past. And the song becomes huge. You know, so it's DJing, it's a mashup, except that now I can play those chords. But the way I make music is still kind of mixing two different records. It's Sometimes having, I'm having like, that ear. Yeah, and, and you know, that it's a way to, to approach music that is a little bit different. But I also realized that classically trained, you know, they were just maybe, you know, like my partner is, uh, he loves back, you know. so. He learned classical music, you know, so we made a record together called Dangerous and he played that amazing melody, but it's very influenced by Bach. But of course, you know, in, in this world, they would never say it, except that I'm a DJ, I don't care, I would, I would, I would say it, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, okay, sorry, so, to answer your question, because I'm going a little bit all over the place. No, no. <laughs> to answer your question, um, yeah, something happened that my music started to cross over, um, even in the US. Um, it was even played on the radio, but only in cities like Miami or New York City, um, that were more like international cities. And um, I made a record called Love Is Gone. And I was still with Chris Willis, you know, my, the original singer that I made all my record with. It's a brilliant record. And uh, yeah, I it, mean, it, it still stands up. There's and what happened at that time, yeah, it's a classic. It became a classic, you know. What happened at that time is that um, there was this guitar sound. I couldn't afford a guitar player at that time, so it was like a plugin, you know. Uh, but it was a French plugin that still today I never said <laughs> where it was coming from. Um, and uh, Will I Am was crazy about this record and was like trying to know who the guy that made it was. And he managed to find my number, texted me, and asked me if I could do something that style. 
um, for his next album and if I could produce for him. And um, I sent him a beat and I was, uh, um, I got a feeling. You know, same guitar sounds, just different chords. Super easy chords, like two fingers again, you know. But, but it, it produces more of a reaction than... Yeah, it's a huge record, you know. And uh, You can have as many chords as, uh, as you want, but if you're not, you know, connecting people and making them feel joy and... Yeah, and, and also the approach was so different because at this time, this was really a turning point because, you know, um, like I said, in the US, you would never hear dance music on the radio, ever. I'm talking about 2009, you know, and um, I also got kind of lucky because at the same time, I came with that at the same time that Lady Gaga came with her album. So, you know, people fear competition. I think it's amazing because it makes you look stronger, it makes it look like a movement, you know. Yeah. And she was very influenced by dance music. And um, even though to me she wasn't dance music, she was pop but she was influenced by dance music. And me, I was like one of the top DJs of dance music when dance music was smaller. So when I came with, I got a feeling, and actually in the same time, uh, uh, you know, um, there was When Love Takes Over with Kelly Rowland. Well, the whole One Love record, which was Exactly, huge and it was Sexy single. Bitch. So those three records came at the same time and memories came uh, with Kid Cudi came right after. But it was the first time that someone from the dance music would create records with famous people. You know, because always house music was like some unknown singers that were usually coming from church, you know, uh, gospel. And, and this gave faith to, uh, faith, <laughs> sorry. And this gave faith to American radio, because they were like, okay, Akon, that's a brand we believe in, Black Eyed Peas, that's a brand, let's try it, you know? And they tried it, and they realized that all the kids loved it. Yeah. And, you know, I just think that at that time, dance music was so underrated, you know? We were not considered real music. But now, you know, I came with those orig original songs that were special and with names that America knew. And in all a second, the entire radio sound changed. And because America is such a huge market, you know, a lot of, actually almost all the pop artists in the US uh, uh, were influenced by that sound. And, you know, it was insane. Like, I had like a superstar calling me every single day to produce. It was just yeah. crazy at that time. Because it, it changed. It must have changed from one minute. Oh, know, yeah. Some record companies and people saying, you know, like, is this going to work? Is this music going to work on our radio? Oh, okay. Akon, he's a brand we believe in. Now it's the other way around. It's like all the pop stars want to work with you and have yeah. you produce them. Yeah, and it was really funny because, like, uh, it, it was a magic moment for me uh, as a producer because really people in the US did not understand this music because this music was born in America but it was always very underground it was born in the black gay clubs you know so mainstream music executives didn't know anything about this music and most of the artists didn't know anything about this music they just they just enjoyed my records and they saw that it was performing well and that I had number ones. So they would give me complete freedom. It was really an insane moment. Like I would tell an artist, you know, this is your single. And they would just do it. They, would, they wouldn't discuss, you know, or, or you know, like I remember the first time doing like running camps for really big artists. And I would ask, but what are you looking for? And they would tell me, no, you tell us what we're doing. And for me, it was just so crazy to be in that position, you know, with people that I was admiring so much. Did you ever find it, you know, at the start of becoming like this kind of superstar um, producer and DJ, did you ever 
get intimidated when you're working oh with my massive God. pop stars and stuff? Oh my God, you have no idea. <laughs> I still remember um, when, we, when we did I Got a Feeling, I was in Los Angeles. You have to understand, I never worked in a studio that was bigger than, you know, <laughs> like, I don't know if you guys do meters, uh, uh, like, I don't know, five square meters, yeah, something really, really, really small. And Will I Am was so crazy that he wanted to release the MP3 demo that I sent him. Because he was like, it sounds amazing. I'm like, are you crazy? There's no way you're putting this on the album. And so I took a flight to LA and uh, went to the studio to finish the record with them. And so was this a much bigger studio than you were? I've, it was kind of, it was actually a joke because I only worked with a, uh, I only knew how to work from my laptop. So <laughs> the, I'm, I'm in this studio with a huge SSL uh, and, um, and the guy is like, okay, what do you need? And I'm like, uh, a mini jack, <laughs> you know? <laughs> because all I could do was really, you know, uh, work from a laptop. I didn't know how to use all of this, you know, and... Um, but it shows that you don't need that, and that must be so inspiring to <laughs> all the people out there who want to make music. Oh, who, absolutely. Who and, just and, have a laptop, and, and, don't but, have money but, to go to studio. But imagine, me arriving there, having the Black Eyed Peas in the studio, and I remember um, Jimmy Iovine, that was always such a visionary, uh, knew that this was going to be the biggest record on the album. And um, he heard the demo, and he talked to all these guys that they have to go to the studio because there's a French guy that have a revolutionary sound and they need to go check me out. But this I didn't know. <sighs> and then I go to the studio and it's like, it was horrible. It was like, not only, you know, I was in a professional studio, which I've never seen, but also there was the Black Eyed Peas and I was so intimidating. And I remember um, there was like the manager of, uh, of Eminem that came there was, uh, I bumped into Pharrell, uh, Chris Brown, uh, like two or three rappers that were on the label. It, it was just insane. It was so stressful for me, you know, and I remember having a moment that there was something so basic to do, you know, like really like something that any amateurs know how to do. And my, I just got so stressed that my head froze. You know, and I just didn't know how to move anymore. You know, it was really terrible. And well, we still ended up still having ended a up pretty good a record. Very big record. And, uh, and uh, yeah, and then from that time, uh, everything changed. You know, dance music crossed over in the US and because American artists are so huge, they became influenced by dance music. So the fact that amazing talents like this would get into this, you know, people like Rihanna and, and Chris Brown and uh, a, a lot of the uh, big, big artists of that time, um, they started to be into this music. And, and of course, it came back to Europe. So it was like an amazing uh, uh, cycle of sounds that were born in the US that was reinterpreted by someone like me from from Europe and going back there, you know, it, it was amazing creativity, you know. And, and then you guys became the new pop stars and the new rock stars, the DJs. And, and I think this was the moment that DJing became a, like a rock, DJs became rock stars, DJs became pop stars. Um, Do you think it, it's cooler these days to be like, because I certainly think like young people today, a, lo a lot of them would find it like cooler to be like a DJ, DJing in a club that's full of people all having a good time dancing than to be like, you know, with long hair and a guitar in a pub. Oh, for sure. I mean, rock is having such a hard time. And do you ever see it coming back? I mean, I, Music I think is it's a very cycle. difficult. Music is a cycle, always, usually 20 years. 
So you think there'll be like a it's resurgence? It's gonna come back, of course. You know? But then there'll be a resurgence. But you know, like I remember like when I had this big pick, uh, you know, with this music, hip hop was dying. And then EDM completely saturated. And then, you know, a lot of people copied my sound and it felt like everything was the same on the radio. I even got tired of it myself. And then there's a reaction to it, you know, and then, you know, hip hop made a major comeback and became the biggest music ever. I think it got to a point when everywhere you go, you hear hip hop, hip hop, hip hop. You go to a supermarket, it's hip hop. You go to a club, it's hip hop. You listen to the radio, it's hip hop. There's gonna be a point that people are like, ugh, we cannot take it anymore. We are cool, we wanna be different because this is what kids do. They wanna be different yeah. the way I want it to be different. And then there's a reaction. And look what happened with Latin music, you know, it was like a, a little bit of a fresh air, you know, to hear something different. And this is always going to happen, you know. So hip hop came back, you know, dance music, I think is going to come back really strong. But so, I mean, dance music is still... It's still big, but if you look at numbers... And the top, it's, the it's, top 50 is a lot not, of hip hop. It, it's not what it was a few years ago, you know. And, and that's totally okay, that's normal. And, um, and, but you've kind of incorporated you know, hip hop and rock and all sorts of genres into exactly, your own music. So, exactly. So for the future, do you, you know, do you still have the same enthusiasm about making records? Well, actually, you've had so much success. You know what's interesting, like right now what I'm doing, um, since a year, I felt like it was hard, um, for dance music in the charts. And I was like, you know what? Instead of copying pop music, I'm gonna recenter on what I was original, originally doing. And since a year, I've been like working on new sounds. And uh, I've been making DJ records that are not meant to be on the radio or not even for streaming. That are more like, I started a new brand called Jack Back that is more like underground. I, um, I started a project with a friend of mine, it's called Morton, and we, we have this incredible rave sound that is like really, it's mad the way it works when I play those records and I have like 10 records in advance. Like it's a really, it's a, it's a new sound, but it's, it's not mainstream, you know, it's, it's for DJs. Um, so I've, because I was getting a little bit, like a lot of successful artists, my music, I, I felt was becoming a little boring because I was so obsessed with having radio hits that I started to compromise so much because of course, you know, success is addictive, you know. It's not even about the money, it's really about success. The, the feeling that I was describing, you know, the first time you have, a, you play a concert and you have 20,000 people that are singing your songs and you're performing in China, and it's insane. And you're like, how is that even possible? Or, or, or in Latin America, or some, some weird countries like this, and you're like, wow, you know. So this is very addictive. And, and, and when dance music was not, you know, uh, uh, being all the top 10 records anymore, I started to wanna, you know, stay in the top 10 regardless and, and make records that were more st strictly pop. And this is, I don't want to say that I regret it because, you know, it's okay. Uh, I've learned a lot from that too. But I feel like there was a moment that I lost my identity a little bit. Um, and what made the crossover records that I made so special is that I was carrying a culture. It was real, you know. And I made it more musical, so it made it crossover. But it was really coming from the clubs, from the DJ culture. And um, maybe I kind of lost this for a minute, 
And I was also a little bit bored when I was DJing. And since this year, I feel like, I feel like I'm 20 years old. Like, <laughs> it's, it's insane. Like, really, like, I had the most successful season in Ibiza I had in 10 years because of that new sound that I have. And it, it, it's just, it makes me so happy. You know, it, it's like, it's like, okay, I'm back to, you know, being a leader. And to me, it doesn't matter if, you know, uh, uh, it's it's like a huge commercial success or you've done if that it's so in much. a club, you know, if I see that all the DJs are texting me like, please, please, please send me this record that you're playing uh, or I hear big DJs that are kind of trying to copy my sound. I'm like, okay, this is cool. You know, that's what I want, you know, instead of me following a train that is not really mine, you know. So um, this is uh, this is what's happening for me today, and it makes me so so happy. You know, that's really exciting. And 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 like and and again, spending a year doing this, um, I'm back now uh, on working on on pop records, but I have this new approach, you know, and so I'm excited again to make pop music, to make real beautiful songs, you know, but because I have this vision that is coming from what I've been through for one year, performing in the festivals, in the clubs, and, and having this new sound that is really killing it. And then I'm like, okay, how do I apply this formula to a real song? So I'm back to the original concept of cooking that yeah. I had at the beginning. And Making it cross over. And this is amazing. You know, this is, this is what makes me happy. Well, it's really inspiring. And you know, the, the joy when you're talking about music is yeah, <laughs> contagious, as I said. So thank you so much for your time today, David. Thank I just you, wanted man. to finish by asking you, uh, who are your favorite artists of all time? You know, like it can be any genre, you know, um, like when, you're, when you're thinking can about Can I give you three? Collection. Yeah, that's okay. actually normal. No? I guess my absolute favorite would be Michael Jackson, uh, because this album, Thriller, my entire life was a benchmark for me of, uh, you know, talking about albums like One Love and Nothing But The Beat. Nothing But The Beat, I think I had 11 or 12 singles on this record. But why? Because I was so obsessed by Thriller to have an album that every record was a single. There was no fillers, you know? Yeah. And... Um, I don't want to compare myself, of course, because like Quincy Jones is God. But you know, it was it was really like, okay, maybe I can come close to to that to, to that level of quality. And it was dance music, yeah, yeah. you know. Uh, but it was dance music with real melodies and 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 it was pop. So uh, this would be my absolute favorite. And then when it comes to what I listen to at home, I love. Um, Motown, Marvin Gaye, Stevie Wonder. Uh, I can listen to this for days. Like, I never get bored of it because of, of soul. And, and, you know, everything that I'm making, I'm always trying to give soul and emotion into it. Um, and, you know, that's why I was so in love with Sia because She's a white girl, but she has so much soul, you know? Yeah. And uh, finding this, this place that is pop, but indie, but soulful, emotional, but energetic, you know? Um, Definitely one of your best. You this know, is what I, where I'm trying to be, you know? Like dancing and crying. <laughs> Yeah, well, a lot of your records, you know, have achieved that. So, you know, th thanks so much, David, and uh, it's been a pleasure to talk to you. Thank and, you, man. You know, very well Thank deserved. You.